Hello, I'm Audrey Tong, Taiwan's Digital Minister in charge of social innovation. And indeed, uh, the way that Taiwan countered the pandemic with no lockdown and the infodemic with no takedowns is rooted um, in our experience of democratizing around the late 80s and then the first presidential election in the 96, uh, which is intertwined uh, with the introduction of internet and the World Wide Web uh, in Taiwan. So it's not just my personal background of, you know, being a high school dropout uh, when I was 15 uh, in 1996 uh, to pursue research on the open world web, but uh, really an entire generation of people in Taiwan who experienced internet and democracy not as two separate things, but as one thing literally at the same year. Yes, gladly. Um, Taiwan was notified of the pandemic thanks to a young doctor, uh, Li Wenliang from Wuhan, who posted on their social media that there were seven new SARS cases in the Huanan seafood market at the December of 2019. Now, in December 31st, 2019, the PTT, Taiwan's digital civic infrastructure, um, get this uh, notification by another young doctor, uh, Nomar Pipe, and PTT immediately start to apply their collective and connective intelligence to triage this news. And <clears throat> just in 24 hours, we started health inspections for all flight passengers coming in from Wuhan to Taiwan. So Dr. Li Wenliang literally saved the Taiwanese people uh, while his message, of course, could not be transmitted to the people in Wuhan uh, because of the very different infrastructure when it comes to internet-enabled listening. And PTT, because it has no shareholders nor advertisers for more than 25 years, is squarely in the social sector operating within the Taiwan academic network with a norm of what I call pro-social media rather than the more anti-social corners of social media. So that was the first, I guess, digital innovation that saved the people in Taiwan when it comes to the pandemic. Of course, mask rationing, contact tracing, and so on were co-created with G0V or zero um, community, around 10,000 people on the same Slack chat channel uh, or Telegram or IRC uh, all the time, uh, contributed to the internationally recognized uh, early response. And this may, of course, also on the SMS-based contact tracing system where people can check in the public venues without having to download any app. Uh, and sending a SMS to a well-trusted uh, number 1922 representing the counter-epidemic uh, command center uh, without uh, having to pay um, SMS charge and no um, worries about the privacy implications as well because it's just stored in the five telecom carriers uh, and if there's no contact tracing request from a local contact tracing office it's just deleted uh, after 28 days so so far there's a quarter billion SMS sent this way and around 11 million that has been used to shorten the contact tracing from more than 24 hours per confirmed case to less than 24 minutes and that's why of course for the past couple of months, there's essentially zero local cases in Taiwan, and we're back to safety. Um, my favorite quote from the Tao Te Ching uh, was, to give no trust is to get no trust. So by trusting the citizens, that is the entire different world, as opposed to if the government has developed one single application. It's not the case in Taiwan. The SMS contact tracing system is not government invention or government technology. As I mentioned, it's part of the GovZero community's co-creation, and the people who participated in the co-creation are the people, for example, who operate the PTT, the people who uh, are in charge of some previous contact tracing systems in other parts of the world, the people who are in charge of one of the most popular messaging tools in Taiwan, and so on. So a broad um, collective, you can uh, call it a collective intelligence, that connects through the network of contact tracing developers around the world uh, mapped out the possible solution space and converged on SMS that's not 
transmitted to government really, but rather stayed uh, in the telecom operators, emerged as the specification. And my role is simply, I call it reverse procurement, right, to deliver on the civil society expectations of a safe and privacy-preserving contact tracing system. So by trusting the citizens and not delegate, but rather working with the people and have the social sector set the norm, the public sector simply amplify these norms and we implement it in a way that's entirely voluntary if you want to use pen and paper or any other method uh, in addition to or replacing the SMS-based contact tracing system, you're still free to do that. There is no penalty for not using this newly invented system, which is why it doesn't uh, foreclose future possibilities of iteration and it amplifies the norm such that the private sectors uh, adhere to the norm not because it's a government mandate, but because the citizens already prototype and ask for it. So I call this forking the government, taking government digital services, developing a different direction by the people closest to the pain and suffering, and our job again is just to amplify them. Yes, that's a really great question. So uh, we use a principle, and by we, uh, I mean the GovZero community who designed this thing, uh, use a idea called secure multi-party computation. It is one of the privacy-enhancing technologies that ensures, for example, the telecoms, which has your check-in SMS records, nevertheless has no access to the mapping table between the digits that represents the venue and the actual venue themselves to individual telecom operators is just random code that means nothing. And for the QR code maker, anyone can be a QR code maker, by the way, but for the primary QR code maker at TradeFan, they do not have any access uh, to your SMS records or indeed of any person entering the venue. They just uh, interact with the venue owners to make some unique 15 digits code. So uh, unless you are a contact tracer that has the lawful authorization to get the puzzle pieces from the Taipei Pass system, from the five telecoms, from TradeFan and so on, uh, individually those data do not compromise anyone's privacy because it's just like puzzle piece without piecing together. It does not complete a contact tracing. So what I'm trying to get at is that if we design with privacy and uh, accountability in mind in the very beginning, then it leads naturally, for example, to people who want to see which contact tracer in which municipality have accessed their records in the past 28 days. And they can simply visit SMS.1922, the GOV.TW, entering their phone number, respond to an SMS, and then uh, just see the entire reverse accountability audit record. And so all of these are earning trustworthiness um, as Joe mentioned, by essentially giving an account whenever there is a doubt, instead of uh, blanketly saying, oh, the state knows the best. Actually, the state just designed the process and mechanism, but do not hoard the data in any centralized way. Definitely. Um, distributed ledger technologies form an important uh, inspiration uh, to the Taiwanese civic technologies community. Indeed, many of the developers in, for example, the Ethereum ecosystem and Tezos and many other ecosystems uh, are either primarily or uh, importantly based in Taiwan. So when we introduced, for example, the mask rationing system last February, people immediately thought, yeah, this is something a ledger technology could help. Uh, and with the help again from GovZero uh, last February, all the pharmacies in Taiwan, more than 6,000 of them, published their real-time inventory of medical grade mask. Uh, every 30 seconds, there is a kind of global update to more than 100 different applications. Some are interactive maps, some are chatbots, voice assistants, things like that, to ensure that whenever anyone purchase uh, two or three masks at a local pharmacy using their national health uh, insurance IC card, um, more than 100 different developers uh, get this 
renewed number immediately uh, so that people queuing after them uh, actually can check their phone and see in real time uh, whether this pharmacy is going to run out of masks, whether they should queue elsewhere. They can make that decision even beco uh, before uh, deciding uh, which pharmacy they want to, to use. So again, this is a kind of coordinated solution, uh, but it's not implemented in a centralized way. Rather, uh, all the different interactive visualizations points out, for example, to the data bias uh, that privileges uh, the uh, urban areas because uh, initially we're distributing based on physical distance, but not everyone owns a helicopter, as the OpenStreetMap community pointed out to us uh, rather quickly. Uh, and then uh, they forked the government essentially by interpolating uh, through an MP to our Minister of Health and Welfare, they said, um, I think we have this better distribution method based on the real-time number that you publish. So demonstration is not a protest here. Demonstration is literally a demo. And Minister Chen said, yeah, legislator teach us. And the very next day, we started implementing a better distribution mechanism. So this is not a accountability in the traditional sense of the government does everything. <laughs> Rather, this is truly co-creation where the citizens can also contribute better algorithm to address data bias. Sure. So for the past 10 years or so, um, GovZero has been systematically looking at the digital services in Taiwan, which is usually something that GOV, the TW, and forking those services into something that G0V, the TW. So, for example, in our national participation platform, join the GOV.TW, if you change your O to a zero, join the G0V.TW, then you get into the Gov0 Slack channel. So, basically, uh, what Gov0 is doing is showing alternate imaginations of what's possible in government digital services, but always in open source and creative common licenses so that it's a soft fork, as we say in the DLT space. If the state uh, um, wanes in popularity uh, and the gap zero uh, alternatives gain in popularity, then the state can at any given time, and we did so for many different occasions, simply say, oh, we can't beat them, so we join them and simply adapt the Gov0 designs uh, through reverse procurement in, um, instead of traditional procurement uh, and integrate it into the government services. Asha. Um, indeed, um, when I was a child in the late 80s, uh, Taiwan already had a very strong social sector. Uh, the cooperatives movement, the social entrepreneurs, the local charities, and so on, indeed delivered many essential services and campaigned for democratization even before the martial law was lifted. Uh, and I think one uh, large event around the turn of century was the um, September 21st earthquake. And the uh, earthquake uh, really caught people of different parts of the social sector, uh, of different faiths, of different practitioners, uh, to essentially work together out of necessity and build social solidarity. Because the disaster is such a massive scale that people simply cannot um, rely on the local and central government to provide the necessary response in time. And afterwards, uh, for pretty much all the large disasters, and I include the Occupy of the Parliament, the Sunflower Movement in that, uh, the social sector that already had a prior experience of trusting each other, uh, simply bonded together. So the Occupy Movement was really orchestrated uh, in 2014 by more than 20 NGOs, uh, which um, has the corners on the Occupy Parliament on the street and actually people, half a million people on the street uh, worked toward uh, getting the messages of the 20 NGOs across each other so that the cross-trade service and trade agreement is debated not from a purely economic perspective but also from the system risk uh, associated to cybersecurity, to labor conditions, to LGBTIQ rights and many other things uh, giving a more full-fledged deliberation on the quality of the uh, occupied parliament and its um, constituents of people who participate in the movement. So I uh, do agree that this is continuous.
Certainly. Um, in, in Taiwan, indeed, uh, we have a constitution that mandates uh, the fostering from the state of the cooperative movements. It's part of the constitution. Uh, and when I was a child, each and every primary school and middle school uh, has to have a consumer co-op within that school, democratically elected, uh, to make sure that uh, we eat healthy food during lunch breaks and things like that. So uh, these are small things, but I do think that it gives rise to a culture where people instinctively think of cooperative solutions to structural social issues instead of relying on the uh, capitalistic solutions that relied mostly on the control of a few shareholders that uh, uh, people has no democratic governance over. Right? So the early experiences are important. And um, in the, this century, of course, we focus on the education reform uh, that replaced the literacy um, to competence so literacy, again, is when you're just a receiver of media, of radio and television, for example. But competence is when we're makers and remixers and producers of our own narratives. Uh, one case in point is that in um, a lot of the schools, I think it's most schools now, um, the climate science and data science are taught via airboxes, which is this device that measures PM 2.5 and other climate indicators and contributes to a distributed ledger uh, maintained by our National Academy and uh, supported by our National Center for High-Speed Computation, but uh, decidedly uh, distributed so that uh, the students learn if they maintain the airbox well, actually their friends, their neighbors, their family, before deciding whether they want to go out for a job or something, uh, will rely on the data that they curate and produce. Uh, and if they want more precision around their community, they can very easily get one. It's open hardware and place it on their balcony or things like that. And again, this is beautiful data collaboratives uh, that the students, uh, without being indoctrinated with any top-down ideas about how data should work, they see for their uh, first-hand um, educational classes and capstone projects how to tune, how to work with the other uh, data that's contributed by other data altruists. Uh, and if there's, as I said, data bias, data stewardship problems and so on, it's uh, within their rights and within their duty uh, to fix that uh, in their school. And I think it's very powerful when we concentrate on the competence rather than literacy. Well, as I said, the social sector, when fully empowered, is in charge of creating the norms and habits. And that, again, has higher legitimacy because of our history as compared to the rules and regulations produced by the state, by the public sector. So, um, instead of a relatively disempowering stance, where each person only contributes three bits of information every four years to governance, called voting, by the way. Um, this is a higher bandwidth uh, direct participation and direct action uh, that can result in better changes faster. So almost like instant gratification. And that, of course, is a very strong intrinsic, of course, uh, incentive, but also extrinsic because by, um, you know, tackling the pandemic with no lockdowns. It allowed our economy to thrive. So obviously there's also an economic incentive at play here. Yes, definitely. Um, so for example, in Taiwan we use uh, still paper-based ballot when we vote for people, electronic, sometimes when we vote for things, priorities and budgets. Uh, but for people uh, ballots, the counting mechanism is very well live streams and recorded. Um, from the very beginning, uh, to ensure the integrity of the voting process, the role of the observer, of course, is highlighted. But because, as I mentioned, uh, the Wild Web is already around when we vote the president for the first time directly, uh, the counting booth became kind of small um, YouTuber uh, recording booth nowadays. Uh, each major party has their own tallying app and you see people just with their smartphones and so on, well, it used to be larger cameras, but the same idea, uh, to, to film the counting process. And, and it has the um, benefits of 
people participating, not as party representatives, but just uh, a lay person, but they can contribute to resolve uh, any election issues. Uh, and when the counting um, app of one major party agrees with the opposition major party, uh, there's simply no dispute and no room for the trolls to grow when it comes to the disagreeing counts uh, on any election counting station. And when you scale it to a nationwide level, it leads to a faster resolution in post-election disputes, uh, which of course doesn't happen in advanced democracies like uh, the US. Uh, but in Taiwan, it used to be a, a problem and people developed digital democratic tools not to replace the paper-based voting, but actually augment that voting with an uh, even more trustworthy uh, counting uh, live streaming process. And uh, leading before the presidential election, there is the presidential debate and forums by the three candidates. And again, the middle schoolers, as well as really anyone, can contribute to the meta competence by typing in what they heard uh, and cross-check it uh, with a wealth of um, databases that is already collected by the professional journalists and help in the fact-checking work. But this is not just assigned homework. If they revealed that the presidential candidate says something that's factually inaccurate, their fact check appear on national public TV in real time. So they contribute to the democratic process, both right before and right after the national election. Well, one impact, um, of course, is that um, I pay also a small amount of land tax uh, each year. And if I think that I shouldn't pay this amount, which is calculated roughly by the real prices that is um, forcibly declared uh, on all transactions uh, around my neighborhood, right? Uh, if I think that for some reason uh, that the land tax that I should pay is much smaller than the amount that's calculated by the peer-to-peer -peer information, well, I, I can say, you know, my, my land was nothing, so I shouldn't pay the tax. Uh, but the result of me saying that is the municipal government can then uh, just acquire uh, that piece of land at the cost of nothing. Uh, because after all, I publicly said that, right? So, so this is the idea of the uh, Herberger's tax uh, that gets more accurate bits of information of the self-gorged land price, even without uh, the calibration of the real price that's uh, the result of real estate uh, transactions around the vicinity in my neighborhood. Uh, still, it incentivizes me to actually pay the land tax, uh, but also report a more accurate number if those calculations are somehow biased. Uh, and so that is one direct uh, result, actually, is a Georgism. Uh, it's uh, one of the ideas that Henry George um, that held and influenced Sun Yat-sen, which became part of Taiwan's land tax system. Definitely. Um, yeah, to, to continue uh, the, the metaphor of Eastern and Western influences, uh, I think Taiwan as an island uh, is defined, of course, by the clash uh, between the Philippine Sea Plate on the east side and the Eurasian Plate on the west side. And when the two tectonic plates bump to each other, we have really large earthquakes. Uh, that, of course, calls for social solidarity and resilience in our buildings, but also the resilience in, in our minds. Uh, so the people who uh, built such resilient, uh, as I call it, transcultural uh, frameworks can absorb uh, the energy that's released by the earthquake, and just like the top of Taiwan, the Savia, Pendokunong, the Yushan mountain uh, that grows uh, two or three centimeters each year as a direct result of that clash. So for example, when we legalized marriage equality, we take the definitely pretty Western uh, idea of marriage by registration and uh, rights and liberties that should be enjoyed regardless of one's gender and sexual orientation. But we also respected and honored uh, the tradition of the kinships uh, that is formed by the familial bounds and so on. So we legalized it using a, a nickname hyperlink act that says only the bylaws are wed when two same-sex persons wed but their families, their kinships, their last name and so on do not 
wed. Uh, and this social innovation is a direct result of a constitutional court uh, ruling as well as two direct democracy referenda that passed and it defined such a solution space that uh, I call it a good enough consensus or rough consensus where everyone can live with. And then this model, uh, quite innovative, is then uh, being considered seriously uh, by other uh, still you know, kinship-oriented societies around us in the Indo-Pacific as a kind of model that will enable the civil liberties and equalities without writing off. Uh, the cultures, and this is just one of the more recent examples of a transcultural uh, republic of citizens. Definitely. Uh, so, as I say quite publicly, that I work with the people, not for the people, I work with the government, not for the government. These connective spaces are designed to make sure that each person participates not as a representative, but just representing their authentic experience and innovations. And this applies also to the public service itself. The <coughs> engagement officers um, that Joe briefly mentioned is one case in example where we put uh, professionals in the public service well outside of their silos as champions of citizen interest. So, for example, when we redesigned the tax filing system in 2017 out of a popular petition that says the tax filing was, and I quote, explosively hostile, end of quote, uh, to non-Windows users, uh, the uh, breakout groups is chaired not by the people from the Ministry of Finance, but rather they could be from the Coastal Guard, uh, the Ocean Affairs Council. But when we talk about the ocean policy, how to enable more support for amateur surfers, amateur fishers, and so on, well, then maybe that breakout groups is facilitated by the Ministry of Finance uh, Public Service. And the idea is very simple, because the uh, Coastal Guard person also have to file their own tax. Uh, and the tax collector uh, is also, of course, an avid surfer in their spare time. So when they facilitate such deliberative town halls and meetings, they automatically take the side of the citizen, because after all, they are as citizens themselves, as um, opposed to representatives within their professional silos. And these are just some of the designs of the participatory uh, officer network that deliberately put deliberation at the core of the public servant's work instead of being you know, a top-down mended way where they have to service the public. So in a sense, it's also an incentive to serve their own uh, self-interest and their community, be it surfer or fisher's interest, uh, while of course offering their uh, professional training as a public servant so that the translation occurs more easily between the professional community, the academic community, and the laypersons. Definitely. Um, in Taiwan, we have this annual event called the Presidential Hackathon uh, that also takes place actually right here in the Social Innovation Lab, uh, where more than 200 projects from social innovators across Taiwan. Uh, we use a new voting system called quadratic voting that invites people to reveal uh, the synergy between those projects. Uh, and with this new voting system, uh, we take the top 20 coach them uh, across collaboration of different sectors until it uh, culminates in the five champion teams uh, each year which receive this trophy from our president, Dr. Tsai Ing-wen. The trophy is the shape of Taiwan, like this, uh, with a microprojector underneath. And if you turn on the microprojector, it projects Dr. Tsai Ing-wen giving you the trophy. So it's very meta, it describes itself. Uh, but the trophy represents whatever you did in the past three months on a smaller scale for one river, for one neighborhood, will become public policy in the next fiscal year, as if it's a presidential promise. So basically, it's a way to offer national agenda-setting power with all the personnel, budget, and regulatory changes required, and invest that to five teams each year. And we just got a result of the five championship teams, actually very recently, uh, in the past couple of weeks. Um, and this time, uh, four out of the five uh, are working on climate change and climate action. The other was on long-term healthcare reform.
So we now have the cases, for example, uh, where the last community, the original community that built those air boxes on the Civic Tech, now shifting their attention to water pollution and measurements through water boxes and many other uh, endeavors. We have another championship team um, evolving the previous championship case uh, where people show a mask map-like system of drinking fountains and refilling people's bottles and calculating the plastic and carbon reduction and apply that idea to cataloging the carbon sinks uh, and make sure that people uh, augment their realities by committing to support those carbon sinks uh, from community action and so on. Um, and so on and so forth, the Taiwan Electric Company also offered uh, a way to use the residual heat uh, from their uh, plants uh, to aid in fish farming uh, and reduce carbon uh, because otherwise it will have to um, emit more heat uh, than required. So turning a side product uh, into something that could be circularly used and so on. Uh, and so I, I believe this is not a, a top-down thing, right? The centralized registry will necessarily come from the various way to account for the carbon emissions and other greenhouse gases uh, from the social sector. And then the championship teams provide uh, a way for us as part of the presidential hackathon committee uh, to look at already existing ways for people around the globe that's uh, making such accounts successfully on the local level, but then elevate the underlying principles to the presidential or countrywide level in the next fiscal year. Certainly. So, um, as I mentioned, uh, already many jurisdictions look at Taiwan, the Taiwan model, so to speak, of a successful people-public-private partnership. But I would like to focus the attention not just on the biological virus and its prevention, uh, or carbon dioxide and some uh, you know, physical emissions, but rather uh, also the uh, virus of the mind. Right, the polarization, the divisiveness, the hate and discriminatory, vengeful action that's taken by people in the more anti-social corners of social media, which may initially be good to manufacture counterpower, but it's not good at all when we're talking about digital democracy. So the idea of a pro-social social media of deliberative design on deliberative spaces, of the nationwide investment, for example, in 2016, when we classified PTT or joint platform and so on as public infrastructure on the digital realm and can allocate special budget money that's previously only allocated to the bridges and roads uh, that are concrete, like made out of concrete. Uh, those ideas, I think, are important around the world for us to reinvest in pro-social social media and the digital equivalents of the institution that we rely on the physical space, the um, you know, university campuses, uh, the parks and national parks, the town halls and so on, so that the citizens around the world would not be forced to deliberate about public issues in the digital equivalent of a nightclub with very loud music and noise and addictive drinks and private bouncers. I have nothing to, uh, to, to I have no grudge against the entertainment sector, uh, but the nightclub is simply not the place to hold a town hall. I have spoken too much, so I'd like to uh, hear from Chen. Definitely, um, and thank you for this awesome conversation. Uh, I look forward to meet you uh, in person, uh, but before then, uh, live long and prosper. Thank you. Mm -hmm. That was great. And, and we benefited in turn from the Occupy community. Our Occupy is a couple years later uh, than the US ones. So we learned ample lessons uh, from there. And, and my personal philosophy of dynamic facilitation and so on uh, are coached uh, 
both online and offline, right, by, by the likes of Tom Atley and so on, who uh, are part of this longer tradition of the cooperative and activist movement uh, in the U.S. So uh, I consider us to be in the same tribe, uh, just different tentacles, I guess, in different time zones. Right. All right, so I have to, to uh, sign off now uh, and see you on the flip side. Bye.